Hi, I'm Brett Winton, Chief Futurist at ARK Invest, and I'm extremely proud to talk about Big Ideas 2023, our uh, annual report on the state of technology and how we see technology changing and evolving. Today, I'm gonna talk about convergence. This has been a year of convergence. There's no question that uh, technologies are reinforcing each other uh, and expanding even faster than we anticipated a year ago and two years ago. Um, the, there are risks of investing in innovation, and um, this is a disclosure slide talking about some of those risks. Uh, I think it's fair to say that technology investing involves all kinds of known and unknown um, uncertainties, and, and that the actual results could and likely will differ materially for how we think they will. Uh, we think part of the value add for us at ARK Invest and, and the research we do is, is we do try to quantify and put numbers to um, the technologies that are growing and, and changing the world and, and really trying to determine um, how big and how valuable these technologies are going to be uh, and then comparing those numbers to how they're valued in the marketplace today. That's how we identify the inefficiencies that we try to invest in to take advantage of the asset accrual that we anticipate. Um, it's clear to us, um, given how technologies are reinforcing each other, that this really is a technological boom, that future historians will look back upon this business cycle and say, uh, we can't believe that all of these technologies were uh, hitting critical stages of inflection at the same time. And in fact, if, if you total up all of our forecasts, you'll find that that we believe that the disruptive technologies that we focus on are going to accrue um, hundreds of trillions of dollars in value over the course of this business cycle through 2030. So today we think that disruptive technologies are valued in the marketplace at roughly $13 trillion. Uh, and we think um, the value accrual will, will uh, exceed 200 trillion by 2030. And so more than half of global equity market uh, capitalization will be comprised of disruptive technologies and the innovation platforms that we focus on. So a reminder, um, these are the five innovation platforms that we think um, will define this decade. Uh, public blockchains, um, particularly um, cryptocurrencies, uh, smart contracting protocols, and the digital wallets that allow um, people to access those public blockchains will, uh, in our view, change people's financial lives. They'll change the incentive structures for how capital is deployed in the economy, and they'll reduce the net drag, the economic rent that's charged by financial intermediaries on, on every single transaction worldwide. Uh, and so, uh, we believe that public blockchains are going to scale um, into the tens of trillions of dollars in, in, in value over the course of this decade. Um, artificial intelligence, I, I think everybody can see that the pace of change is accelerating with artificial intelligence. This uh, innovation platform has the steepest cost decline of the, any of our innovation platforms, and it's most critical to catalyzing other innovations, as I'll talk about. Uh, and so. Um, the AI software is going to become the dominant form by which um, software advance is delivered over the course of this decade and command um, more than $10 trillion a year in, in revenue, in, in our view. Uh, multiomic sequencing uh, is um, the idea. Multiomics is, is, is actually a term that some of you might not be familiar with, but it's not just the DNA, which is the recipe for your body that's important to developing biological understanding of what's going on. Uh, it's also the um, um, things that are on top of the DNA that control which, which genes are expressed, as well as all of the data that's feeding from digital health um, platforms that help us to tie kind of what's going on at the molecular biological level to the actual diseases that people have. And it's going to, we believe, change Cancer care with multiomic technologies, that precision therapies will be developed that will be worth uh, trillions of dollars, uh, and that uh, an emerging capabilities in programmable biology will change the way that food is produced and, and, and how expensive it is. On the energy storage side, um, this for us comprises both electric vehicles as well as um, kind of autonomous mobility solutions. Uh, and 
in over the course of this business cycle, this may have the most tangible impact to people's day to day lives as um, owning a car, for example, could become really optional for people even in the Western world, since it'll be cheaper to ride around in a robo taxi that delivers you from place to place for you know, tens of cents per mile uh, is safer, more convenient, and allows you to sit in the back seat and, and uh, watch Netflix while you're getting to or from work. Um, and then the the in a call it the the earliest and most emerging, I think, of these innovation platforms is in the robotic space. Robots have been around for a long time in the industrial automation setting. The advance here is is robots that can operate alongside humans, reusable rockets that can um, deliver low Earth orbit um, communications constellations that, that radically reduce the cost of, of connectivity on a global basis uh, and, and 3D printing that can allow uh, manufacturing to happen closer to the end user with an infinite variety of parts available to the manufacturing entity, regardless of supply chain vulnerability. Uh, and so these five innovation platforms um, are both self-reinforcing in all at critical stages of inflection. Uh, and so one of the things, uh, one of the activities we've undertaken is to score these innovation platforms on the degree to which they're converging is uh, how does um, an advance in, uh, in neural networks uh, impact uh, the the rate of change for next gen cloud or um, the capabilities of multi-omic technologies or uh, autonomous mobility. And, and so this visualization on the right is, is, is actually a mapping of that convergent scoring. Uh, a few things here, you can see that each color represents one of the innovation platforms I was talking about in the previous slide and that um, this um, network graph actually emerges from that convergence mapping to reveal the 14 underlying technologies that we focus on, from digital wallets to advanced batteries, from adaptive robotics to precision therapies. Uh, and, and that the five innovation platform buckets we talk about emerge organically from this mapping of convergence. So you can see that our um, kind of the definition of five innovation platforms um, maps to these 14 technologies and these 14 technologies themselves are, are more tightly interwoven at that innovation platform level. So, um, you know, the next gen cloud is gonna be required to uh, allow neural networks to be trained and to operate at scale. Uh, the capabilities of neural networks are going to reinforce and in fact be critical to you know, whether or not uh, augmented reality glasses actually become viable devices for people to buy, and they'll feed straight into the capabilities of the smartphones that you have today. Um, so the, um, I talked about convergence. Uh, if, you, if you unpack this graph to measure the uh, relative convergence importance of each technology, uh, you can see that, that neural networks or artificial intelligence, um, deep learning systems are by far um, the most important in terms of their ability to catalyze other technologies. Uh, on the left is, is a, a quantification of that. Um, roughly the way, the way in which the convergence scoring is, um, is quantified is that um, uh, a, an order of magnitude uh, increase in the in the addressable market for another technology is is essentially a score of one, and everything is is scaled on that basis. So you can say that that it, an advance in neural nets, uh, uh, if AI accelerates, uh, we believe that corresponds to to basically four other technologies roughly increasing their addressable market by uh, an order of magnitude. Uh, and, and so you can see it, it's tied into uh, advances in neural nets are tied into almost every other technology that we focus on. Um, but it's critically tied into, uh, for example, autonomous mobility and the ability of adaptive robotics. And so one of the, the advances that we've seen over the last year that, that really gives us confidence across all of the technologies is that neural nets, AI capability is happening faster than even experts in the field anticipated. Uh, inverting it, this is a measure of, of how sensitive um, the technologies we focus on, on are to other catalysts. So uh, autonomous mobility systems are, 
are the most sensitive to accelerations in other areas. This makes conceptual sense that a reduction in the cost or an increase in the energy density of battery systems means that you can have more form factors that the aerial drones will become more capable and have longer range at lower cost. Um, and in advance in neural networks um, allows, and in fact is, is required for um, autonomous mobility to operate in, in really challenging open space driving situations, for example. Uh, and so the um, essentially accelerations in other technology lead to a potential two order of magnitude increase in the addressable market for autonomous mobility in our view. Uh, and, and so just to focus again on, on artificial intelligence and, and how that acceleration is feeding into these other technologies, uh, it's clear that um, advances in AI are driving, so to speak, Robo taxis. So uh, in Tesla's AI day, they they talked about um, how the system can approach a, a, an intersection that it's never seen before and understand essentially the taxonomy of how you can drive through that intersection. Where are the likely pathways of travel? How do lanes um, merge or unmerge? Um, in a, a if you have two left turn lanes, you know how does that feed into the 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 four lane road on the other side, for example. And the way they solved this problem is using what's called the transformer architecture, which was originally uh, introduced in, in 2017 as a way to make AI systems better at translating language. So uh, an advance in an AI um, language translation system, which became the advance that has driven all of the innovation we've seen in large language models and in AI natural language processing, fed directly through into the ability of a robo taxi to understand an intersection. Uh, and so this is, and, and it's not just robo taxis. If you, if you look at long read sequencing within the multiomics technology space, uh, this is a long read sequencer is something that can read your um, genome. Uh, and instead of cutting up the genome into really little bits, it, it constructs the genome out of longer um, clumps of DNA and stitches them together to understand um, the genome and, and actually to um, more completely understand the genome than is possible with small bits. Uh, one of the um, drawbacks of that approach is, is those DNA chunks that had a, a higher uh, error rate. Well, by using that same transformer technology and applying it to a long read sequencer, um, there is a 59% reduction in that error rate realized over a couple of years of, of just deploying that transformer architecture against long read sequencing. And so again, it's an advance that happened because we were trying to translate language better with AI. And lo and behold, it turns, like, turns out it makes a long read sequencing box, uh, reduces its error rate by, by almost 60% without any change to the box itself. It's just an AI software upgrade to the box. Uh, and it's not just long read sequencing. If you go over to, um, to, to the robotic space, that same transformers advance from, from 2017, you would think, well, it makes sense that it would be useful to be able to talk to a, a robot in natural language and say, hey, go pick up that object over there. But this is actually at a, a, a more profound architectural level where by using that um, transformer architecture for neural nets and applying it to a robot, you can see that the robot gets much more performant on tasks that seen before uh, the error rate uh, you know, it was only completing it 70% of the time, roughly, um, with a, with a, um, without a transformer architecture, without this AI language architecture, um, helping it to understand the underlying task that it's doing. Uh, and then that completion rate improved to 97%. And then on tasks that robots had never seen before, these papers were robots that were in a kitchen being asked to like lift up a spatula, for example. Uh, the, the completion rate improved from 19%, so only one out of five times would it get the thing right, to, to, to more than seven out of 10 times was the robot successfully completing this task. Uh, and so, um, you know, net of all of the technologies we look at, the rate change in AI accelerating is the one that feeds most importantly through to the other technologies. And so we see all of the innovation happening in the AI space today and say, hey, this means that everything is going to go faster, not just AI, that multiomics and energy storage, that robotics and public blockchains are all going to be driven forward by, by advances in AI.
Uh, and it's not just AI that's feeding through to other technologies here. We're showing how uh, kind of our convergence scoring indicates that, you know, advances in batteries feed through to advances in intelligent devices. The iPhone that you buy today has three times as much battery as the iPhone that you bought in 2008. And if you look at the, the critical path for developing augmented reality goggles or, or VR headsets that are, that are performative and can last long enough to be interesting and, and not too heavy, well, it runs through the quality of the battery and the density, energy density of the battery you can put into that headset. So an advance in electric vehicles can actually accelerate the adoption and the performance of um, the intelligent devices that, that we're going to buy and use to, to, to access the, the AI, advanced AI systems that, that we think are going to be deployed over the next few years. Um, similarly, a, 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 an advance in robotics also feeds into a, a more capable set of intelligent devices. You know, that we can launch a, a low Earth orbit satellite constellation inexpensively allows um, that telecom satellite constellation to um, provide our smartphones with capabilities that, that they simply didn't have a few years ago. T-Mobile is going to allow you, a user of, uh, of an iPhone, to access satellite connectivity from you know, anywhere in the world where they can strike an agreement. And conceptually, it could be any, anywhere in the world. You could be in the middle of the ocean, uh, and your iPhone will suddenly have a signal via a low Earth orbit satellite constellation made possible by SpaceX's rockets. And if you look, you could have done this in 1998. There was actually a low Earth orbit constellation uh, lofted, but you would have required a, a specialized headset that would have cost 15 times more than an iPhone. And your cost per minute at the time would have been roughly 40 times more than what T-Mobile is going to monetize it at. Whereas today it's, it's going to be the, the headset that, or the handset that you have, the smartphone that you have, and uh, T-Mobile is just going to bundle it in the plant. It'll become, you know, part of this is what we expect cell phones to be able to do. Um, and on the cryptocurrency side, so um, I think many don't appreciate that, that uh, public blockchains and cryptocurrencies in particular are not just a, a potential alternative um, currency that, that offers user self-sovereignty. They're also an important energy tool. Uh, and so we have previously demonstrated that um, if you deploy a solar system, um, you, can, you can provide somebody with 40% with of their, their uh, electricity needs. Uh, but if you start making the big system bigger than that, um, then, then you, the electricity you generate begins to get more costly because you're generating too much electricity uh, during very sunny parts of the day and um, the person can't use it at that time, so it's just spill over its waste effectively. Uh, and so you can uh, attach a battery system to, to, to that solar uh, installation, and that helps somewhat, but also you run up against the limit of the ec economic size of the battery system you can install. If you attach Bitcoin mining as well, then you can make both the solar system and the battery system larger. Uh, and anytime there's excess energy coming off the large solar system, the Bitcoin miner can mine and, um, and compete in the economic game to produce Bitcoin. And this allows a solar system to scale from 40% of the end use needs of the user all the way to 99 plus percent effectively make the system grid independent uh, and it can do so because it, you can build larger solar and a larger battery system since you have uh, essentially an, an outlet mechanism for the excess energy that the system produces uh, into Bitcoin mining. And so the, the size of the battery, which is represented on the y-axis here, gets larger. The, the economic size of the battery you can build gets larger as you attach Bitcoin mining. And so um, kind of a more valuable Bitcoin network actually feeds into more demand for battery systems. Um, so what does all of this add up to? Um, the, you, these converging technologies um, are, we think, going to lead to remarkable macroeconomic growth. And here we're presenting a long history of macroeconomic growth and demonstrating in the purple bars that actually um, discontinuous changes in the annual rate of real economic growth are the norm, not the exception. Driven by technology, you know, over the course of distinct time periods, 
defined by technological transitions, we have gone from, um, you know, doubling and 10xing kind of the rate of macroeconomic growth per year. Now, in the red bar here, you can see that the consensus forecast is this long technological economic history is over. The assumption is that the advances that we've had all the way from, you know, year one to year 2021, that that techn technological advance, that the march of technological history is ending. We're at the end of technological history. We think that's um, actually wrong. And, and, and the data would suggest, and you can see as we transform the X or X axis here, that uh, a forecast consistent with technological economic history would suggest that we are moving from a, a 3% real growth rate per year into a domain of eight plus percent real growth per year. What does this mean tangibly? It means by 2030, we could have 20,000 real GDP per capita as opposed to the consensus, which is 15,000 real GDP per capita. And, and the, the growth rate would not slow down. We think it would accelerate from there. Um, now, this is a very crude forecast necessarily because we're taking a very long data series and we're saying, well, this is what it looks like could happen. So I would not be confident in this forecast if we weren't able to point to the technologies that are going to deliver um, that result. A note of caution, you know, uh, macroeconomic statistics have a hard time taking on and embedding um, disruptive technologies. So um, the, somebody buying an electric vehicle today, as you can see on the left, they're paying maybe one and a half times the purchase price. This is comparing a, a, a Tesla Model 3 to a Toyota Camry, but they are reducing their ongoing operating costs of that vehicle over time. So it looks like they're spending a lot of money. Uh, at, in actuality, the total cost of ownership for that vehicle is lower. It's, uh, and the, the future expenses are diminished. The, the amount of oil demand clearly falls off a cliff. Uh, and, and, and even if you accommodate the need for electricity or the need for repairs, uh, you end up with a, a bringing forward of demand and then a reduction of demand in future years. Uh, on the right, we're showing if somebody cuts the, the cable cord, if they stop paying for pay TV uh, and switch to streaming services, that looks like uh, degrowth from a macroeconomics perspective. They're spending less for TV, so it's a lower GDP. But clearly, from the consumer perspective, this is more valuable entertainment. There, a consumer can switch over to streaming for a lower aggregate cost and get the same number of entertainment hours uh, on demand without commercials. Uh, and so the disruptive technologies are often mismeasured and, and kind of confound the measurement of macroeconomic statistics. So with that as a caveat, we can point to the technologies that we've modeled, the five innovation platforms, and say with some degree of confidence that we think that that, that um, macroeconomic forecast of accelerating growth, the one that's consistent with technological history, is likely to come true. Uh, if you look at energy storage largely driven by robo-taxis, we think that robo-taxis are going to deliver $26 trillion in real GDP uh, incremental to consensus by 2030. And then robotics as well as they infiltrate people's homes and they allow manufacturing processes to accelerate will deliver in excess of $10 trillion in real GDP growth um, in, in incremental GDP relative to consensus by 2030. Adding up those two alone, those two innovation platforms alone, and those are ones that are more likely to be captured in the macroeconomic measurements, would suggest that we are on the green trajectory here rather than the red trajectory. So um, while I would be cautious about this particular forecast, if I were using these data alone, um, the fact that our modeling of individual technology platforms that are at a critical stage of inflection suggests that the green trajectory is right and going to be realized over the course of this decade suggests to me that we are in a, a state of discontinuous change in macroeconomic growth. On the right side of this forecast, there are, I'd say there's less certainty about how um, kind of these technologies will be measured in the macroeconomic statistics, but it's very clear given the cost decline in AI, given the human health impact of multi-omic technologies, 
and given the efficiencies that were likely to, to ring out of having truly digitized finance, that, that there could be tens or even hundreds of trillions of dollars of additional macroeconomic product delivered by these technologies. The, the largest bucket here, of course, is AI software, where we think the best way to think of AI software is it is a knowledge worker force multiplier. So a, a, an analyst becomes that much better, a, a CFO becomes that much more um, powerful and precise, uh, an administrator um, can, can, you know, can, can actually um, manage you know, more assets and, and, and that will feed back into the real growth that we see in the economy and the actual produced items that, that we get. Uh, so, of course, large macroeconomic growth, large uh, value add to the economy, we think will lead to large market value accrual. On the left, we have roughly the state of the equity markets in, in at the end of 2022, you had $84 trillion in non-disruptive innovation exposed market capitalization and roughly $13 trillion in uh, disruptive innovation exposed market value, inclusive of uh, public blockchain protocols. Uh, and um, by 2030, we think that, that those legacy businesses, they might accrue value, but it, but it won't be at a, any kind of extra normal rate. It'll basically be a, on a real basis, a 2% compounding and that the innovation platforms, uh, as they infiltrate every sector in the economy, as they deliver you know, profound productivity advances, are going to accrue profound value. So we think more than $200 trillion in value will accrue to these innovation platforms, um, and, and all with um, growth rates in, in excess of, of 25%, uh, and, and that the, the, the the shape of exposure to, to um, equity markets will change, that more than half of equity markets will be kind of disruptive innovation exposed, that, that public blockchain protocols will, will be seen truly as a, a new financial category that, that allocators will need to be exposed to. Um, and that if, if you're not uh, aggressively exposing yourself to innovation now, uh, you'll be left behind by the growth. Uh, and so, um, you know, just like we think that the, the, the macroeconomic growth is going to surprise to the upside driven by innovation, we actually think equity market appreciation is going to um, surprise to the upside driven by innovation and accruing to the benefit of the, the companies that are enabling these innovation platforms that, that have ownership of the innovation platforms themselves or aggressively using these tools to enable them to, to deliver um, better cash flow to their shareholders and better uh, in product to their customers. Um, so uh, that's, uh, you know, how we think technologies are converging and what we think is in store for, for both the market and the economy over the next decade. Uh, I appreciate the time and attention and, uh, and look forward to seeing how this technological boom plays out.